Hi there, my name's Guy, you're watching Midwinter Minis, and welcome to the new studio. This video has been very kindly sponsored by Incogni, and in it we're going to do a deep dive into hands down one of the coolest Space Marine chapters in Warhammer 40k, the Salamanders. We're not only going to be covering how to paint salamanders, I'm also going to be touching on their in-universe lore, cool ways to convert and customise your army, and also summarising how they actually play in the tabletop game. And hopefully this way you'll have a one-stop point of reference for this awesome Space Marines chapter. Now, if you know all about the lore and want to skip to the painting, or just find out what cool conversion ideas there are, check out the timestamps down below and you can just jump right to the bit that you want to see. This is the first part of what I hope might turn into a fun new series on the channel, where we cover the basics of lore, converting, playing and painting different Space Marine factions in a single video. Let's just get on with it, shall we? The Salamanders are a venerable, noble and highly respected chapter of the Adeptus Astartes, and are unwaveringly loyal to the Emperor of Mankind. Originally the Dragon Warriors Space Marine Legion, the Salamanders were reforged during the Ultima founding, led by the now missing, potentially deceased Primarch, Vulcan. They are the 18th Space Marine Legion, and call the inhospitable, fiery planet of Nocturne their home. The gene seed of the Salamanders chapter contains genetic adaptations that help them survive and thrive in Nocturne's brutal environment, resulting in their distinctive coal-black skin and innate resistance to extreme temperatures. While Nocturne is their homeworld, the Salamanders are headquartered in their fortress monastery on Nocturne's enormous moon, Prometheus. Unlike some chapters driven by zeal or honour, the Salamanders prioritise the preservation of human lives above all else, even their own. They strive to minimise collateral damage and safeguard civilian populations whenever possible. In battle, Salamanders exhibit a combination of discipline, strategy and fiery aggression. Their tactics often centre around close quarters combat, taking advantage of their incredible strength and resilience. Bolter, Flamer and Melter weaponry are the Salamanders' preferred tools of war, allowing them to unleash devastating torrents of flame that not only consume their foes, but cleanse the battlefield. This fiery approach to warfare mirrors their Primarch Vulcan's mastery over fire and forges, a legacy they carry forward with great honour. They're also known to decorate their armour with hides of the fierce dragon-like creatures that inhabit their homeworld, colloquially known as drakes in the lore. Among the notable characters that have risen from the ranks of the Salamanders are Chapter Master Tushan, whose leadership and valour have guided the chapter through countless conflicts, Adrax Agaton, the formidable captain of the Third Company, wielding the iconic Thunderhammer Malleus Noctum, and Master of the Forge Vulcan Histan. Adept in both combat and craftsmanship, he carries the mighty Spear of Vulcan. Although the force of the Salamanders is unknown in the current lore of the Warhammer 40k universe, their legion was around 90,000 strong at the end of the Great Crusade. But astonishingly, over 80,000 were lost, including their Primarch Vulcan on Istvan V during the cataclysmic Dropsite Massacre. The only remaining outposts of Salamanders at the time contained two or three thousand Space Marines at most, and since then several millennia have passed, and while it's not quite clear, it's thought that the Salamanders number far fewer than many of the other Astartes chapters. Now, one question we always have to ask when we're talking about a Space Marine chapter in Warhammer 40k is, could their Primarch return? Primarchs returning are nearly always narrative-driven events to push forward the story in novels and for the tabletop game, but in the written lore Vulcan's fate was left somewhat open-ended. He had disappeared, leaving behind artefacts and clues that suggested his potential return in some form. So personally, I wouldn't rule out the return of Vulcan, but when that might happen and what form he might take, that remains a mystery. Like other Space Marine chapters, Salamanders have faced most of the alien and warp-tinged threats to humanity that are out there, but they have a particularly deep disdain for the Drakari, the Dark Eldar. 
Their animosity is rooted in the fundamental clash of their respective beliefs, where, as I've already said, the Salamanders are known for their dedication to protecting humanity and valuing honour, the Drakari are sadistic and hedonistic, and thrive on pain and suffering. The Dark Eldar's brutal, tortuous, and merciless nature runs directly counter to the Salamander's principles of safeguarding innocent lives. So that was a basic introduction to the lore of the Salamanders, and obviously there was way more I could have spoken about, but as I said, the idea of this video is to give you a good overview. If you want to find out more, I'd recommend checking out the Black Library novels, Salamander, Vulcan Lives, and Prometheus Requiem, all by Nick Keim, as well as The Beast Must Die by Gav Thorpe. I reckon that'll do for this section. Next up, the conversion and painting process. But before we jump into that, you remember I said we were in a new studio? Well, thanks to Incogni, the sponsor of this video, I don't have to worry about one of the most annoying things about moving, and that's other people's data following you around and being linked to the property you're now in. As you know, modern life is full of junk mail and cold calls and shadowy online data collection. This profile of you, your name, physical and email addresses, phone numbers, aliases, purchase history, you name it, is then sold by companies called data brokers. Sounds great, huh? Now, you're entitled to follow the small print paper trail and do lots of research, find these marketing companies and manually opt out, but that involves emailing or actually writing physical letters to ask for your data to be deleted. But there's dozens and dozens of them, and that would take so much time. And obviously that's by design. They want you to just give up and accept that your data is a product to be bought and sold. Fortunately, that's where Incogni comes in to save the day. They do all the hard work for you, sending removal requests on your behalf while you get on with the other important stuff in your life. I joined back in February, and in less than half a year, they've already removed my data from 53 brokers, which is awesome. I've genuinely noticed way fewer cold calls coming to my mobile, which, in my opinion, is worth the sign-up fee by itself. And the process of changing my opt-out address was as simple as it gets, and Incogni does all of the hard work for you behind the scenes. If that sounds like something you can get behind, use the code MIDWINTERMINIS following the link in the description, and you'll get a 60% discount on an annual Incogni plan. 60%! That's crazy good. Huge thanks to Incogni for sponsoring this video and helping me stick it to the data brokers. And now let's talk about model options and conversion ideas for Salamanders. Games Workshop make a few dedicated character models. There's Adrax Agatone, a new model with the big Primaris proportions. There's also Vulcan Histan, but his model is a little bit older and he will look a bit small next to the newer versions of the Space Marines. It's also easy to forget that the Death Watch Kill Team Cassius box set contains this awesome Salamander's Flamer Terminator called Garen Branatar. It might seem a bit silly to buy a whole box set just for one model, but the other models in the box have fantastic resale value on their own, or you can just use them for fun one-off painting projects or for conversion bits if you really dedicated. There's also a Primaris upgrade pack available with two small sprues of pauldrons, heads, hammers and bits and bobs, but there's a lot of repetition there. While Games Workshop probably have some more unique salamander infantry or characters in the pipeline, it's hard to do the cool fiery reptilian aesthetic of the salamanders justice just using the official models at the moment. And that's where third party companies can really help out. Just be aware though that if you use any of the following parts in your salamanders army, you would be ineligible to use them in any official Games Workshop tournament. That will bother some people, but for the majority of hobbyists and gamers, that doesn't matter at all. First up, Liber Demonica have some pretty cool heads, bodies, and leg sets that would make amazing salamander proxies, especially the Hydra and Draco heads, the Vulcan torsos, and the Vulcan legs. You'd end up with lots of repetition if you only used these, but peppered through your army as sergeants or special characters, they'd look great. Cromlech also do some amazing salamander-inspired designs called the Dragonborn. Their range is a bit more extensive, even including some vehicle bits, but my favourite is definitely these cool shoulder pads. However, the most complete range of viable bits I've found is from Spellcrow and their Salamandra range. They've got tons of standalone weapons, legs, bodies, jump packs, vehicle parts, and even trophy drake heads and hides to decorate your characters with. If you're after a cheap supply of thin plastic scales to use as drake hides, it might realistically be worth checking out what cheap or secondhand dinosaur toys you can get your hands on. Cut them up and have fun. 
If you know of any really good salamander bits, whether they're resin or 3D printed, let me know in the comments and I'll try to include as many links as I can in the video description. Now, as I said, while there aren't that many dedicated salamander models, the new Inferna squad that comes with the Leviathan box set, which I'm sure will have their own standalone release very soon, are perfect for your salamander infantry. And given they're armed with big flamey pyre blasters, very lore accurate. I'm going to be using one of these models for this video, customised a little bit with some 3D printed parts that my good friend Steve made. I told him that I was going to be making a video on salamanders and he designed a set of awesome rebreather inspired heads, fuel tank power packs, tons of flame spewing weaponry and a drake hide texture press mould to make your decorative dragon skin bits to whatever shape you like. Now the best part for me is that Steve's included both standalone weapons and weapons with hands attached, so you can basically transform any Primaris sized Space Marine models into Infernus Marines, just in case you were wondering what to do with all of those intercessors you don't want to build. Now if you have a 3D printer and want to grab these parts for yourself, I've left a link in the description, and the whole bundle is less than £4 too, cheap as chips. So for this model, the gun on this Infernus Marine looks cool enough, so I'll keep the gun it has, but I will swap out the power pack for a fuel canister version, and a normal head for this menacing, heavily piped version, facing forward for maximum intimidation. While the normal plastic model will go together best with plastic cement, I'm going to use superglue to attach these resin parts, as plastic cement won't do the job here. Now let me show you how easy it is to use this press mould. I'm going to use Milliput for this, as it's water soluble before it's cured, mix the two parts together until it's all one colour, and then lay down some scrap plastic wrap. Anything will do really, a slice of sandwich bag, some cellophane, basically you just want something that's shiny and non-porous that you can flex the Milliput off before it fully dries. Smush your Milliput down onto it, wet the surface, smooth it down so it's completely flat, and then lay down your press mould, texture side down onto the Milliput, and give it a push. Once you're happy with the pressure you've put on, slip something like a knife edge under the lip of the press and flip it up. The moisture should stop it sticking to the press mould, and look at that, we've got some texture. Give this an hour or so to firm up before you try to remove it from the plastic. In the meantime, don't forget to scrub the milliput out of the press mould with a brush if there's not too much, or a toothbrush if it's a little bit more clogged. Anyway, once the milliput has started curing, but before it's totally rock solid, free it from the backing and cut it into whatever shapes you like. The texture should be fairly robust after an hour or so, so don't worry too much about handling it. Use super glue to stick it down to whatever surface on the model you want to cover, and gently press the edges down. Give it another few hours to fully cure, and then it'll be ready to paint. If you want it to look a little bit fancier, you could use some spare purity seals at the edges, like they're pinning on the hide, or if you want a more regal look, you could opt for layering on some small jewellery chain too. And there we go. Some really easy component swaps and a bit of customization, and we've got a pretty unique looking salamander ready to paint. I'm going to mount him on a little plastic shot glass with a dab of super glue under one foot, and once we're done painting, a quick hard snap should release him easily. So conversion ideas covered, let's get painting. To paint a salamander space marine and make them distinct from the other chapters, we have to make sure their armour is noticeably more light and vibrant than the other chapters, like Dark Angels for example. Starting from a black primer, we're going to do a heavy dry brush of Caliban Green, which yeah I know that's the Dark Angels colour, but we're basically going to use this as the deepest, darkest shadow colour. Once that's dry, another very free and easy dry brush of Warpstone Glow, a more saturated vibrant green, which will basically be the mid-tone of the armour. Now grab a random bit of kitchen or packing sponge, tear off a chunk and dab it in Warboss Green, or some other suitably bright garish green. Start tippy tapping all over the armour plates, but don't bother too much with the deep crevices or recessed areas, leave them as the mid-tone colour. We're just trying to create a mottled armour texture here. Before we go further with the armour, let's start blocking in all of the other colours. First use a desaturated gold to paint any aquilas or insignia on their armour, and any random spots of trim that you want to accentuate. I think melter and flamer weapons look pretty cool with a bronze or golden business end too. Now I'm going to switch out to a metallic gunmetal colour and paint all of the boring, non-trim bits that look like they would be bare metal, so maybe vents, pipes, and, if you can be bothered, the ribbed under armour that you can find in the cracks on the crotch, knees and elbow. 
With all of these stages, don't worry too much about getting the wrong colour on the armour, as we can fix any mistakes in a minute. We want the drake skin to be pretty distinct, so let's base coat it with warboss green to make it noticeably more vibrant than the rest of the armour. Now, using quite a light brown, I'm going to base coat all of the pouches and weapon holsters. Switching to a deep blood red, we can paint the wax sections of the purity seals, and also base coat the eyes. Again, don't worry if you make mistakes. I'm making plenty, but we can tidy it all up soon. A very pale warm white like pale sand to base coat the purity seal parchment, and your favourite black paint to base coat the smooth inner surface of the pauldrons, leaving green only on the trim. Base coat the body of the weapons black too, and I also think it would be pretty cool if the bodies of the fuel canisters were also black. Now that's the core base coat colours applied, this is the perfect time to go back with a bit of the mid-tone green, warpstone glow in this case, and just touch up any areas you went over the edges or splodged the wrong colour on the armour by mistake. Now we've got a relatively tidy looking marine, we can add some subtle shading to the whole model. By mixing a sepia wash with a black wash in equal parts, you can get a pretty effective one wash for all colour shade going on. I thinned it with a tiny bit of water too to make it less stainy, and then covered the entire model, being a bit careful not to let the wash pull too much in any one place. And once that's dry, you can easily just leave it here for your rank and file infantry, but we can add a few quick steps to make your models really pop. First, let's revisit the purity seals and eyes with a vibrant red. You can even add a bit of yellow into the red to create a more fiery tone, and paint this towards the front of each eye lens. Smooth out the raised areas of the parchment with another, thinner coat of off-white. Mix your lightest green with off-white to create a pale green colour to dry brush onto the drake hide to bring out all that lovely texture. If you want to add a pop of colour, you can also thin down a contrast paint like Pterodong Turquoise or a wash like Drakenhof Nightshade and glaze it on towards the edges of the hides. A nice neutral mid-grey like this is perfect for adding some select highlights to the black areas. You don't want to touch the main body of the area as it'll stop it reading as black and start looking grey. Instead, spend a few minutes adding careful edge highlights to the top facing edges of the sticky out bits. Don't worry if you mess up, it's very rare to get a perfect line the first time. Don't be afraid to cut back in with the black if you need to tidy up some of the highlights. If you want to give the pauldron the official Warhammer look, you want to also add a thin line of grey highlight to the inner edge, following the line of the trim, but leaving a tiny line of black between your highlight and the trim. Very, very tedious. But annoyingly, it ends up looking pretty cool. <laughs> As I said, these highlights aren't perfect, but I'll revisit them with some black to cut back the highlight and make them a bit sharper. Every Space Marine chapter has their own unique chapter symbol, and the Salamanders is undeniably very cool, a big old dragon's head. Now, there are ways to get official transfers. You can get the two small transfer sheets in the Salamanders upgrade box, but that only gives you 10 pauldron sized transfers per box. Not that great. Or you can get the Horus Heresy Salamanders transfer sheet, which gives you loads, but it's 22 quid, so let me show you how to just paint the chapter symbol instead. With grey paint, sketch out the rough shape of the head, starting with a diagonal line for the top of the head at quite a steep angle, and then another line at the bottom of the head at a much shallower angle. Fill in the area between the two lines, but leave a little black area towards the front behind, and that's going to be a guide for the mouth. There's a little flared sticky out horn over where the nose will be, and another one over the eye, and then either four or five sticky out horns at the back of the head. Now don't worry about getting perfect shapes at the moment, you're just marking out where the key elements are going to be. Now switch to black and start cutting back into the grey to refine the mouth shape, adding some basic teeth, add a tiny streak on the nose for a nostril and a bigger one for the eye. Now switch to a thinned white paint and basically just colour in the areas you feel confident with, letting the grey basic shape guide you. After one, maybe two coats of this white, you should have something that looks pretty decent. Again, don't be afraid to switch back to the previous colours to fix mistakes or change the shape slightly. And obviously, if you're going to be painting a whole army of these guys, you're going to be mastering the basic shapes in no time. But it's a pretty natural, nice shape, so much more forgiving to paint than something strict and geometric like the Ultramarine symbol, for example. 
Now that's out of the way, you can spend as little or as much time as you like with a vibrant, slightly yellow green, adding edge highlights to the raised, prominent edges, especially along the top facing parts of the armour. As I like to paint quite efficiently, I hit almost nothing below the waist, focusing my attention on the top half of the model. You can also use some black wash and a detail brush to sketch on some tiny lines on the purity seals to look like script, and I also use this black wash to add some sketchy texture on the leather areas. If you want to highlight some of the leather, you can mix some off-white into the light brown you use to base coat, and again, use small sketchy strokes in the areas that were least affected by the dark wash stage. Once this is all done, I like to warm up any leather areas with a light glaze using a sepia wash. We can also use the sepia to start creating a muzzle burn, heat stress look on the weapon. Stipple on a band of sepia in the middle of the metallic element, and then paint the last third of the weapon's muzzle with Druchii Violet. And then when that's dry, add Drakenhof Nightshade to a small area around the tip. Right, let's snap him off his shot glass so he's ready to be based. You might want to just give the undersides of his feet a quick coat of dark green just in case the raw plastic might be visible once it's actually on the base. Now, it's pretty fitting to give salamanders a suitably rocky, lava-like base like their home planet. Let me show you two ways of doing this. The first version is really, really simple. You'll want to prime your base white, which might seem like a bit of an odd choice for a dark lava base, but we're going to be working in reverse here. Once your white primer is dry, paint the whole thing with the most intense, vibrant yellow you own, and then add some streaks of hot orange. Feel free to blend with the yellow that's not quite dry, but then also add some red, doing a similar thing, but trying to keep it within the main sections of orange. Finally, add a really dark, deep red, but keeping it within the areas that are already quite a dark red. Once you're happy with how that looks, wait for it to dry, and then add a coat of PVA glue. It'll take a couple of hours to dry, but once it dries, it'll have a nice, shiny, smooth surface. And this is where we're going to add the Citadel Texture Paint Mordant Earth. Slap it on nice and thick. Ignore all your instincts to keep it thin. It needs to be thick to make good cracks. And as it dries, it pulls back on itself, revealing the bright lava colors beneath. And this is where the smooth PVA surface really helps out here, making the cracks obscenely large. Give it a quick black rim once it's fully dried and you're done. You might want to add a layer of varnish if you're going to be gaming a lot with them, just to stop cracks from flaking off over time. Now, if you want a slightly more three-dimensional look to your bases, let me show you how using a really useful hobby tool. Cheap cork placemats. I bought a set of four from a charity shop for one pound a few years ago, and they've been used for so many projects cut into them a little bit, break them open, flake off sections, and as you can see the natural cork texture will make for great rocky outcrops. Use super glue to layer them up on your base, leaving little bare channels between some of them. Try to be as random as you can, some with more rocks, others with less, and also don't forget to test fit your models as you go to make sure they ultimately have a good flat-ish surface to stand on. Mark out where the feet are going to go, and then add extra chunks and details to the areas where the model isn't going to be standing. Now we can pull out a crackling texture paint. Mordant Earth, Agrellan Earth, the colour doesn't really matter as it's going to get painted anyway. Slap it on nice and thick in all those channels and gaps that you left behind. Now using a regular chunky, crunchy texture paint, make those flat cork surfaces look a little bit more interesting. And once it's dry, you can mount it on something for easy painting and prime it black. Using an airbrush, for the first time in this video, I may add, I'm going to make the channels much more vibrant by spraying on multiple thin layers of white ink. The magic of this method is basically all down to this ink, FW Fluorescent Yellow. So incredibly vibrant, my camera has a hard time capturing it properly. It's very transparent, so needs the white to even be visible. I then swapped out to an orange ink and used this to target the edges of the rocks, basically letting the overspray also tint the brighter channels in the cracks too. And then I used some red ink aimed pretty much at the bulk of the rocks. When that dries, we can re-establish the darkness of the rocky parts by mixing red and black together to create a very deep browny black and dry brush the rocks. It doesn't matter if you catch some of the channels as the texture paint will catch the colour and it'll look even cooler. And when that's dry, add a slightly lighter dry brush of just black. Now to really bump up the contrast, we can reinforce some of the hot spots on the lava by manually adding some white spots with thinned white ink. And again, 
manually adding some fluorescent yellow over those areas once the white's dry. Touch the edges with orange and red inks to make the transitions a little bit more realistic, and you're pretty much done. If you want a little bit more colour variation on your lava rocks, a light dry brush of a medium grey would bring out some texture. A black rim, and let's get the Space Marine glued on. Hot oh, damn, that looks nice. Yes, look at him. <laughs> he looks awesome. Now, before we end the painting section of this video, let me show you a really fast, effective way to get that spooky, monochrome, charcoal skin tone that salamanders have. Slightly counterintuitively, we want to start with a white prime or undercoat, and then we're going to paint the whole thing using a 50 50 mix of Basilicanum Grey and Black Legion contrast paints. These will settle into the recesses and make them proper black, but also heavily stain the surface too. If you want to add more depth to the shadows, like the areas under the cheeks or eye sockets, just add another coat once the first one's dry. And then we just need to add some really easy highlights by simply mixing a bit of white into the contrast paint mix we just used on the skin, and just paying a little bit of attention to the forehead, brows, cheeks and nose. Don't overdo it though, if you're trying to convey that the skin is very dark, less is more, really. It's best to complement this monotone skin with gold cybernetics and armour pieces if your character has no helmet. Silver would just make it look a bit washed out and boring. So that's pretty much everything covered in terms of model painting for salamanders. Now you're all set to physically create your army and get them looking fantastic, but how will they play in the tabletop version of Warhammer 40,000? We're actually in a pretty unique place with the tabletop wargame at the moment. At the time of recording, 10th edition has only been around a couple of months, and while Salamanders had their own codex supplement in 9th edition, at the moment they're basically just green space marines with no chapter specific rules or exclusive squads or vehicles. However, they do have rules for two unique characters, Adrax Agatone and Vulcan Histan, both of whom have their own unique abilities which will affect how you play the game. Vulcan has an ability which benefits Torrent and Melter weapons, which thematically you're going to want to be taking a lot of anyway. He's also great at controlling objectives, making him a defensive powerhouse. Adrax's melee prowess is ridiculously brutal up close, but not only that, he makes enemies that he's beating up much worse at holding objectives. So again, fantastic at holding objectives, but also a dab hand at capturing them too. Being Space Marines, they play as you'd probably expect. Decently tough, good saves, good shots, not bad in close combat, decent all-rounders, but thematically, and to benefit from your leader's special rules, you're going to be wanting to pack a lot of flamer and melter weaponry. Also, they're salamanders, that's sort of their thing. To create a very thematic, law-appropriate army, you'll want to avoid using too many fast things like flyers, bikes, storm speeders, and lighter, more tactical scout units. Big, heavy firepower like eradicators, infernus squads, and terminators is where it's at with salamanders. And while they, as a Codex Astartes following chapter, will make use of all and every weapon available to them, their vehicle of choice is the Land Raider Redeemer, with its incredible toughness, intense flame weaponry, and transport capabilities. Now, if you like the lore and tabletop style of salamanders, but aren't really sold on their green, black, and gold aesthetic, you might want to check out some of the cool successor chapters for more inspiring colour schemes, and yet another way you can personalise your army. The monochrome black dragons of the Cursed Founding. The very mysterious black vipers. The gilded covenant of fire. And the holy primaris successors, the dark krakens. There's more, obviously, but... Man, this video is crazy long already. So that about wraps it up for this debut episode of, um, well, I hadn't really thought of a name. Uh, how about uh, Astartes Archive? Yeah, let's see if that sticks. If you want to help me choose the topic for the next episode of this series, there is only one way to do it. And that is by becoming one of the channel supporters over on Patreon. That's how we ended up with the Salamanders episode. Our awesome supporters there literally pay the bills for this channel, so I think it's only polite to let them guide what we make. If you want to join them, you can from just $2 a month. And not only do you get to have your say in what kind of videos we make, you also get access to our Discord server. And a shout out in a video when you sign up. So while I thank the newest members, let me show you some of the awesome Salamanders that our Discord users have painted up. And also lots of scaly creatures 
creatures to give you some inspiration for Drake Hyde colors. Jonathan Jacobson, Victor Hale, Joseph P, Guillermo Gutierrez, Trevor Schechter, Marco Bonom, Elijah, Julian White, Jamila Damini, Matrius, I'm Not Zack, Thomas Jones, Bombastic Turtle, Verbachte Herr der Dunkelheit, Jamie Parmenta, Luprical Horus, John Hislop, Fish Palace, and Henry Malloy. Also, also, there was a conversation happening in our Discord server where people were saying, wouldn't it be hilarious if the salamanders in Warhammer 40k had the same dopey grin as real world salamanders? And Kate Holden made it happen. He is beauty, he is grace. He has a salamander face. And by the way, if you want to own this particular mini, it's on eBay right now with a £1 starting bid, and I'm happy to ship anywhere. We've also got some really awesome new merch on the way, including gorgeous art prints of the Midwinter Minis Warlord Titan, painted by Artists Empire, and also a stylized version of Hattie's Great Unclean Boogie by Remouse, available to pre-order too. Head to midwinterminis.com to get a piece of that action, and thanks again to Incogni for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to check them out if you want to stick it to the data brokers, and thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.